Well, welcome everybody. Um, this is session two of our um, week on study diagnostics. Um, uh, earlier today or for yesterday for some of you, um, we had a session on study diagnostics for our anti-VEGF study that was led by Fon Bu uh, and encourage you all to take a look for that for those that are interested in that study. Um, in this session, you're going to get to hear from Nicole and Mitch about study diagnostics with specific uh, with specific uh, reference to our fluoroquinolone anti-aortic aneurysm study. Um, so I think the the plan for today is for Mitch and Nicole are going to go through the conceptual ideas, some some basic ideas of how the screenshots of the app works, and then we should have ample time at the end to also dive into the live application and start looking at some of the initial re results. Uh, I encourage you all to post your questions in the chat as we go along, uh, and I'll be monitoring that while Mitch and Nicole are talking and try to answer questions there. Um, and I'd also um, encourage for all of you who have access to data, we're going to be talking about the preliminary results of a small number of databases, but we're really hoping that all of you will be contributing results from your data into all of the SOS challenge studies, but specifically here for fluor fluoroquinolone aortic aneurysm, we know that there are at least 20 databases in our network that should be contributing, and we only currently have study diagnostics for four, which means we're still waiting on a whole lot of folks to, uh, to join in and participate, and we're offering office hours later in the week for those that are maybe just still working through the technical issues of how to make that happen. Um, but I encourage you to, to, to contribute to this conversation as we go along and we'll we'll stop to answer questions at the end and I'll try to moderate chat. But for now, I'll turn it over to Mitch and Nicole for this session. Great, thank you, Patrick. I will uh, go ahead and share my screen and uh, let me know if anyone's having trouble seeing my slides. They should be up. Yep, they've they're up. Great. OK, so thank you. As Patrick said, we're going to be going through the study diagnostic for our study of fluoroquinolones and aortic aneurysms and aortic dissection. Um, just a few uh, things up front. Uh, I just want to acknowledge the hard, hard work by the, the study execution teams. Anthony Senna, Jenna Reps, and Chung Soo Kim worked very hard to get us some results, which just came in today. Um, unfortunately, Nicole was sleeping in her time zone when these came in, so you are going to, in this presentation, see some screenshots when she gives a tour of the strategist dashboard um, that are actually from the VEGF study, but um, that's mainly so, sort of for the purpose of showing you how the dashboard works and where you can find things, so it should be fine, but otherwise we will have some diagnostic results from the IBM Medicaid database in here. Switching. Great. So. Um, we have sort of in week six through eight have been talking last week about analysis execution. This week we're covering study, sorry. Uh, so, so this week we're kind of covering study diagnostics and next week you're gonna hear about evidence synthesis. So uh, in 2022, uh, many of us saw the um, global symposium plenary by Martin Schumi. And his key message was that in order to reduce post hoc investigator bias, we need pre-specified objective diagnostic rules that evaluate the re reliability of analyses and results should be blinded if they fail study diagnostics. So essentially the main issue here is that sometimes we see a result that aligns with our expectation of what the result would be and we don't dig deeper, but if it sort of contradicts our expectation, we're more likely to dig deeper and identify problems with the study and then not publish it. And this act sort of can introduce bias to sort of the body of evidence that we consider. Um, so the assertion by Odyssey is that the best practice should be the diagnostics need to be performed before ever inspecting study results, and we can enforce this through software design. Um, there are two potential approaches that are compatible with Odyssey's tools. So a protocol could be conducted and basically a study implemented with our tools where the results are completely blinded. And so in that case, the protocol might actually contain diagnostic results at the point of writing the protocol. And also you could write a protocol that actually contains pre-specified diagnostic rules. So as long as they're not modified post hoc, but you might have a protocol that just specifies the rules and does not actually contain the diagnostic results themselves. So very broadly, we sort of have study diagnostics surrounding the three different domains of study designs that we use. 
in Odyssey. So characterization, we have cohort pathways, feature summary, incidents, population level estimation. We have the comparative cohort design where we are going to be assessing things like statistical power, comparative comparator similarity, between person confounding, generalizability, and residual bias. In the self-controlled case series, there are some important assumptions that need to be met in order to conduct that analysis that we will also evaluate. Again, statistical power, time varying confounding, um, protopathic bias. In other words, does the outcome uh, cause the exposure and not the exposure causing the outcome, and residual bias, so systematic error. And also next week, you're going to hear more about the diagnostics we use around meta analyses, which will also include evaluations of statistical power across the data network, also assessing heterogeneity before combining estimates into a single um, meta analysis estimate. And in patient level prediction, um, Jenna Reps has done a really great job going through uh, diagnostics for that design, and we have uh, the probast criteria are sort of the guidance for all of the different diagnostics we'll hit, and we will cover that a little bit later. So just to run through the list, again, we are going to discuss uh, diagnostics around statistical power, the minimum detectable detectable relative risk, target comparator similarity, empirical equi and we will be looking at empirical equipoise, between person confounding, which we can assess with covariate balance, generalizability, which we will um, get at with the attrition fraction, residual bias, which will be estimated using the expected absolute systematic error, which is produced by our negative control distribution. And in the case of SCCS, again, looking at time trends and outcome incidents, pre-exposure outcomes for that protopathic bias, and in prediction, those probas criteria. So to jump in, um, we're going to start by discussing the statistical power diagnostic, which is the minimum de detectable relative risk. Um, so as, as you all know, statistical power refers to the probability of detecting an effect if the true effect exists. So this is the inverse of the type 2 error, the type 2 error being the probability that you, or sorry, the type 2 error being the case where you incorrectly accept a null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is false. So statistical power would be the probability of detecting an effect when the null hypothesis is false. In interventional studies, we have sort of, um, we, where we're prospectively recruiting patients, we have sort of a given hypothesized effect size. We try to get an estimate of the background incidence, and then we determine what size of a study do we need to study this? How many patients should we recruit? In non-interventional studies where we already have the subjects available to us and all of their data, we can actually calculate the um, background incidence, et cetera, and we already know the sample size. So we can ask the question, given the available data, what effect size would this analysis be able to detect? So if the minimum detectable risk ratio was two, that would mean that if the true effect was lower than two, we are not powered to reject the null hypothesis in that case. So typically more data provides greater power. Um, design and analysis choices can affect how much data are used to generate estimates. But in, in some cases, having a small amount of data can actually be um, can confuse our interpretation of the results because it may look like there's a null finding, but actually you just simply did not have the study power to produce a sub significant finding in that case. And so there is a, the goal of the minimum detectable risk ratio is to avoid producing hard to interpret underpowered estimates. And um, we can discuss sort of the nuance and, and certainly you'll hear more about that in the meta-analysis next week, but in the case where we're actually combining database specific estimates into a single meta-analysis, we sometimes do want low power estimates to contribute data to that meta-analysis. So just to walk through some examples, um, many of you who have experience with the um, cohort method dashboard will have seen minimally detectable risk ratios. This is an example from the legend hypertension study comparing lisinopril versus hydrochlorothiazide. And as you can see across this, um, across this table, uh, we have uh, very, uh, very good study power. Basically, all minimally detectable risk ratios are below 1.75, which would mean that we have the ability to detect a 75% increase in risk. So here I'm going to show you an example of uh, limited study power that is a problem. So as you can see, the MDRRs in this case are, are high, 
Um, and so we are underpowered in this case and would not be able to, uh, we would not be able to reject the null hypothesis in the case that the true effect was lower than 6.27. So given that plausibly the many effects are much lower than that, in this case, we just simply don't have a study that can actually produce a significant finding. So in this case, here are some of the diagnostics that we're going to talk through for the fluoroquinolone study. Um, as I mentioned, we're only going to have IBM Medicaid in this presentation for the purposes of demonstrating to you how the diagnostics work, but we can spend more time with the different the other databases and other analyses uh, a little bit later. So what I'm showing you here is um, the comparison of fluoroquinolones against uh, cephalosporin and trimethoprim. And I'm showing you the first two rows, the 30-day follow-up, and the bottom two rows, the 365-day follow-up. So as we can see, all of our analyses have a minimally detectable risk ratio below 2.37, which would mean that we have the ability to detect 137% increased risk if present. Um, but when we consider a longer period of follow-up, we get more outcomes in our analysis, and that increases our study power. And so the 365-day analyses shown in the bottom two rows actually have minimally detectable risk ratios less than 1.4, which means for those, we would be able to detect a um, smaller effect, a 40% increase in risk. So moving on to empirical equipoise, uh, the diagnostic we use to assess empirical equipoise um, is based on the preference score. So um, again, remember that we are always trying to sort of emulate a hypothetical randomized trial when we design, design a um, comparative cohort analysis. Um, so in this case, the randomized, uh, sorry, randomized clinical trials uh, have perfect equipoise by design. So in a one-to-one -one randomized head-to-head -head trial, each subject has a 50-50 chance of getting either the target or the comparator, and no patient, uh, covariates are correlated with that assignment since it was fully randomized. However, in non-interventional studies, we have already, we are observing prior treatments and those treatment choices are correlated with the patient characteristics. We choose a comparator based on our, uh, like, sorry, we choose a comparator based on uh, before we actually conduct the study. So in this case, we chose um, uh, the, the, sorry, I'm, I'm, blanking on the two, but uh, we've chosen our comparators ahead of time. And the preference actually is a transformation of the propensity score, which scales to the prevalence of the treatments and tells you sort of the probability that a patient would have gotten one treatment or the other. So a preference of 50% means indifference between assignment of the treatment or the comparator. So in this case, equipoise is measured by the actual preference score. The proportion of the target population that is in sort of treatment indifferent is defined by cut points um, established in a uh, paper published in 2013 by Alec Walker. And we define uh, equipoise as people with a preference score between 0 0.3 and 0 0.7. And ideally, we want as many people as possible in this sort of range of overlap where they could have received either treatment. And we, uh, in the literature, it suggested that greater than 50% of patients should fall within this preference score range of 0.3 to 0.7. So just to demonstrate sort of what these look like from the legend study, we have a comparison of valsartan versus olmosartan. And uh, we can see that this is very uh, strong overlap in the pre uh, preference scores. So when we actually look at the range between 0 0.3 and 0 0.7, we can see that greater than 90% of patients fall in that range. So we have really strong clinical equi or empirical equipoise here, where the clinician probably was truly deciding between these two drugs when assigning them to these patients. However, in a separate comparison of valsartan against uh, chlorth chlorthalidone, we can see very strong separation in the propensity scores and non-overlap of these uh, sorry these preference scores, and so this tells us that um, basically it's it's probably unlikely that there was a clinician who was deciding A or B in this case that these are truly different patients and there's sort of motivations why they would have received one treatment or the other, and so here we can see that less than thirty percent of patients fall between our range of zero point three to zero point seven. Um, and uh, another sort of interesting interpretation around a diagnostic like this, which was raised by Chan when we were talking about these diagnostics, 
is the concern that in all observational studies, we do have some amount of misclassified variables. And so what we may be getting is that there are clear variables that determine whether you receive valsartan or chlorthalidone. And if to some extent those variables that determine which treatment you're getting are misclassified in our data, it might cause people to appear in the middle of our um, propensity score distribution. So in addition to sort of the concept of not having patients who are actually indicated for both treatments, you might have an issue with misclassification indicated by your, um, by your lack of equipoise. So in our study here, I'm going to show you first the results for um, fluoroquinolone against uh, trimethoprim. And again, this is IBM Medicaid. We can see we have really great overlap in this case. More than 88% of patients are in clinical equipoise in IBM Medicaid, falling in that range between 0 0.3 and 0 0.7. And in the comparison of fluoroquinolones against cephalosporin, we actually have less overlap. And it's it's not horrible. It's it's pro it's just on the border of what uh, Alec Walker's paper would describe as uh, clinical equipoise. So if greater than fifty percent of patients fell in this range, we would pass that diagnostic. But in this case, we have slightly below that. Um, and we'll talk about the thresholds that we've set for our own diagnostics. But this actually does pass in the diagnostics that we applied for this study. Um, but it's just slightly less and something to be mindful of in our interpretation. So it might be a limitation section mentioned. And I, and I just add, add Mitch, because I think this is a really interesting point, is we we spent multiple sessions discussing the comparator, but we this is the first time we're actually seeing data about the appropriateness of the comparators, and it doesn't necessarily, you know, immediately jump out, like, you know, when, when we were discussing it, now that we see the data, we may be able to post hoc rationalize why might that happen? And we'll even be able to look and see exactly what are the predictors. But up front, we thought these are two comparators that are both really good. And so the fact that in this database, one of them looks very similar and one of them looks similar, but not as similar is a really interesting insight. And as, as we'll see as we dig in further, that isn't even necessarily the same pattern that we will observe across other databases. So it's really right. great to have these diagnostics in place. And it is Can interesting. Because... A, a... Oh, go ahead. Mitch. No, 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 please, please. Well, I was, was going to. Say... I was gonna... <laughs> no, I was please gonna say, go. Please go. Yeah. Um, that uh, it would now be the time where you'd say, you know, not as good as we would have liked. You know, maybe we, you know, we could consider an adjustment to like a, you know, third generation cephalosporin as something that, you know, might match better. Like <clears throat> we have, you know, we have not unblinded anything yet. Would this be the time where that would be permissible, or would you say it passed, so we'll run with it? In this case, we have unblinded the estimate because it was a pre-specified threshold. So not in, to in me, this... <laughs> <laughs> right? Right. Yeah. So so we have unblinded ourselves already to this result. Um, but but I do think you know. Um, one thing I've I've spoken with Martine about specifically is the the question of like whether empirical equipoise should disqualify us from looking at a result or contributing it towards some sort of meta analysis. You know, the the idea being that um, you know, I, do we look for representative rats when we establish causality in a rat population? especially with the tools that Odyssey offers, you can actually select this population and then describe all of their features and provide a full feature extraction um, characterization of those patients. And like you could imagine a more technically capable Cochrane um, future where Cochrane meta-analyses are able to take sort of this population and map it onto some population of interest. So I think the point would be that the patients in this range of equipoise, there might still be valid uh, causal inferences you can make about those patients, but the concern is more about external validity. We've now limited our population based on the propensity score. Who are we really describing? And we actually do have some other diagnostics that can look at that. But, but I do think there's sort of open questions about the value of producing causal inferences in a group um, that, that is sort of in the region of equipoise for an analysis like this. And one other quick question, this is this, this equipoise is evaluated within our indication cohort, correct? This is? Right. This would be okay. the final study cohort that has been selected. Okay. Yeah. Right. And uh, 
And another thing to note about your this particular study question is just that these are medicines that are guided by guidelines, and which might be why we see separation in these curves is that there's guidelines indicating when patients should receive one versus the other. And the reason that the equipoise might differ across different countries is that those guidelines might differ, and, and furthermore, the availability of different treatment options. So um, again, in this case, we have 43%. So these equipoise numbers are sort of provided in, in, a, in a format um, within the strategist dashboard, which Nicole is going to show you later. Um, I'm going to try to keep moving. So covariate balance, I'm sure everybody is familiar with this. We have a scatter plot, which shows the distribution of our covariates before and after adjustment. Um, so confounding variables that are imbalanced between our target and our comparator can uh, bias our estimates if they are associated with our outcome. Um, so we have many different design choices like restriction matching and propensity score adjustment um, that are, reduce the effect of confounding. And the nice thing about propensity score approaches is that we're actually able to produce this diagnostic where we can assess in the adjusted population, did we actually reduce the differences in those variables across our target and our comparator? So for each covariate, we calculate the standardized mean difference, um, comparing the distribution in the target and the distribution in the comparator. And just a rule of thumb, which was asserted by Steve Austin, um, was the standardized difference of means should be a, less than 0 0.1. But again, we probably, for all of these diagnostics, need more rigorous research sort of studying these cut points and whether or not they're the, the most relevant. So again, just to go through an example, we have our scatter plot here. On the x-axis, we're showing the uh, standardized difference between the target and the comparator before matching. And on the y-axis, we show that standardized difference after matching with each dot corresponding to an individual covariate. And so as you can see, the standardized differences on the x-axis go quite high. So we had many variables that were substantially imbalanced. But once we applied analytic adjustment, everything was sort of brought well under control. And as you can see, we are well below the threshold of 0 0.1. So this is a um, analysis where, that we have strong uh, reason to believe is unconfounded. So uh, this is an example of a comparison where we had a lot of imbalance before and after adjustment. And so you can see that many, many covariates did not pass our diagnostic of being less than 0 0.1. And so in this case, we would uh, fail this analysis. So first, I'm going to show the, the comparison of fluoroquinolone versus trimethoprim, uh, again, in the IBM Medicaid database. And I have trimmed the, the y-axis so you can see a little better, which is why the 45-degree line, this dotted line here, is, is not exactly 45 degrees. But you can see, again, we did have covariate imbalance. Um, that wasn't honestly horrible. Most covariates were imbalanced, uh, had a standardized mean difference less than 0 0.2, um, but brought well under control by the propensity score matching approach that we applied. So the co covariate balance for the comparison of fluoroquinolones versus, uh, I'm sorry about this, I, I didn't adjust this, but this is for the, um, compar the second comparison. So in this case, we have um, stronger imbalance that you can see. So the x-axis before adjustment is going up to 0 0.6. So things were much more imbalanced for this comparison, but again, brought well under control by the, by the matching procedure. So we also uh, have approaches to look at generalizability. And the way that we do this is with mainly the attrition fraction. And there's also a second diagnostic, which is not available currently in the strat uh, strategist dashboard, but looking at a standardized mean difference diagnostic that we can briefly discuss. But generalizability sort of asks, to what extent can a study result be applied to a target population of interest? So within Atlas, we define a cohort that gets forwarded into our analyses and there are sort of analytic restrictions that are applied. So for example, we might restrict to the time period where both exposures were on the market. We might uh, restrict patients who have previously been exposed to the prior exposure. But what this and uh, what we are going to look at is sort of do our analytic restrictions substantially alter the target population that we defined within Atlas. So we can actually uh, assess sort of the proportion of patients that leave the cohort when we apply our analytic restrictions. And we do that with the attri attrition fraction. And then we could also compare sort of characteristics between the cohort, the target cohort 
defined an atlas and the analytic cohort that we actually define. And we could do that with a standardized mean difference. So just to sort of walk through this, imagine you have a target population. A good example would be when our analytic cohort is basically our entire target population. And maybe you have a few people being dropped for not meeting certain analytic uh, requirements. And a bad example would be having a large target population where your analytic restrictions exclude the vast majority of your target population. So if we could look again at the um, legend results, here we have a comparison of lisanopril and lasartan. And in this case, you can see that we actually um, do very well because we have a very similar number of patients in the bottom bottom left box showing the proportion of the target or sorry showing the number of the target and comparator patients that are included in the final analytic cohort and in this case they've actually added some of the restrictions that were applied inside of atlas but the target cohort here is about the same number as you can see as the final analytic population so in this case uh greater than 26 uh, or sorry i think it was 26 percent of patients left the cohort so in a, ba a, a bad example where we're failing this diagnostic, we have sort of the same numbers up top, 650,000 and 92,000. And you can see that this population is reduced down to um, 85,000 in the target population. And so 85,000 out of 650,000, we're losing just a very large share of patients. And if you look at this scatter plot on the left, again, this is not a diagnostic that's currently available in the strategist dashboard, but you could imagine um, a, creating a dot for each covariate and then assessing the proportion, um, or sorry, on the x-axis, we have the proportion of patients in the target population that have those covariates, and on the y-axis, the standardized mean difference when we compare the analytic cohort against the target cohort that we created in Atlas. And so in this case, we're seeing that many covariates are meaningfully different distributions in the target and the analytic cohort. Mostly we're seeing that they're covariates that are not super frequent, but we are seeing a few frequent covariates that are very different between our analytic and our target cohort. So in our case um, of the fluoroquinolone studies, and I hope you can see this, it is a little bit difficult to see. Um, just to be clear, this is the analysis where we're studying aortic aneurysm and aortic dissections as a composite outcome. Um, so here what we see is we have in the target population 163,000 patients in Medicaid, and that is reduced to 88,000 patients when we apply our analytic restrictions. Um, with the largest restriction being the matching on the propensity score. Um, and also, because we're looking at sort of transient exposures, that first box where we're restricting duplicate patients to the first uh, treatment they received, we do lose a lot of patients there, which is um, to some degree expected to this for this uh, analysis. So in our case, we have greater than 50% of the target population remaining in the cohort for our uh, trimet trimethoprim analysis. When we compare to uh, cephalosporin, we have uh, a slightly different situation. We have we have a little bit more uh, more patients leaving, um, particularly for the matching on propensity score step. So in this case, we have forty one percent of the original target patients included in our analysis cohort. And and sorry, one thing I will just sorry no no I'm not going to say that. Thank you. Um, so finally, residual bias or the expected, uh, the ease statistic. So expected absolute systematic error is a statistic that we're able to estimate from our empirical null distribution that we get from our uh, negative control uh, estimates that we produce. Um, so we can, we produce a distribution of estimates corresponding to each negative control finding, which the truth should be one. And that was why we selected it as a negative control. And since we know the truth should be one, we can measure the bias by calculating on the log scale the difference between the estimated risk ratio for that negative outcome and the actual like null estimate, which we know to be true. And then we can plot that on a, uh, we can take sort of the, the, the average value of the abs, sorry, the average of the absolute value in order to produce this ease statistic. Um, 
And then we can use that, uh, that distribution to actually calibrate our results. So this actually serves as both a diagnostic and an analytic adjustment, to be clear. So again, from the legend study, here we have an example of a negative control distribution comprised of 62 negative controls, uh, or sorry, 68 negative controls. And we can see that about 95.6% of confidence intervals include the null, which is exactly what we'd expect, generating 95% confidence intervals. And we have a minimal ease statistic. And so what we see is these negative controls are centered about one. And if you saw them off center, that would be a bad thing. But in this case, they're centered about one. So when we go to calibrate our actual effect estimate of interest, we see very little movement in this case from 1.54 to 1.51. However, in a comparison where we have a lot of residual bias, we actually can see in the sort of uncalibrated estimates below, only 43.9% or of confidence intervals include the null. And we can see that they sort of skew to the right, indicating some sort of upward bias. And so when we calibrate our estimates, we are going to move the estimate quite a lot. And so in this case, calibration moves the hazard ratio from 5.55 to 2.86. However, the E statistic here is indicating potentially problematic residual bias that you have not addressed in your study design, and so um, would be a would would indicate a problematic diagnostic. And then, of course, you can have some that are sort of more of a maybe, um, where the movement isn't quite as strong. But one sort of important thing to consider if you're if you're interpreting analyses that are using calibration is sometimes it doesn't take a massive movement in a hazard ratio to actually change the statistical significance. So while the movement of your point estimate might be small, the qualitative conclusion of your analysis can actually change entirely. And so that's a situation that um, sometimes requires caution when, when interpreting. So here are the results of our study. And the good news is, is we have great, um, expected error indicated by our null distribution. So if you look at the bottom panel before calibration, uh, we have 49 negative control estimates, and we have 95.9% .9 of confidence intervals, including one. And uh, I suppose I, I, I kind of uh, squandered the big reveal, but you can actually see this is for the 30-day follow-up. The actual effect estimate here was before calibration, exactly one on the null. And after calibration, just a tiny movement to actually make it a slightly protective effect. But again, none of this changes the qualitative conclusion, which is that this is a, a null finding. And finally, for the comparison against uh, cephalosporin, we see the same thing, uh, maybe a little bit more uh, residual bias, um, which would be expected given that we saw a little bit more imbalance for, for this comparison. Um, but in this case, 91.8% of confidence intervals, including one. Um, and then after calibration, 98%. But in this case, once again, the uh, calibration has very little effect on our estimate. We go from a hazard ratio of 1.15 to a hazard ratio of 1.12. So lastly, um, I just wanna say that these diagnostic thresholds, as we mentioned, are rules of thumb. Some of them are really well supported by research. Others are more a guess or a sort of rule that has been established by the field. Um, so on the left, we have sort of some well-known literature derived values. So I mentioned that um, for equipoise, Alec Walker's original paper asserted that 50% of patients should be in that equipoise region. Um, to be clear, our strategist interface, for some of the reasons we discussed, requires that only 20% be in that uh, range of equipoise. Um, but more broadly, for covariate balance, we use the Austin standard of 0 0.10. For statistical power, because we might want to um, contribute individual database estimates towards a meta-analysis, we're pretty loose, but we have a value of 10. And uh, systematic error, we require to be less than uh, 0 0.25. Um, and for the attrition, just to note, we talked about the attrition in our study ultimately passed. We actually do not uh, blind ourselves to results on the basis of attrition fraction at this point. And I do think, yeah, just to be clear, one of the most important things is just making sure that you pre-specify these to address that sort of post hoc bias. And to some extent, while it would be really helpful to define these more clearly, the pre-specification is, is one of the major goals in reducing the amount of bias in our body of evidence.
Great. Okay, I'm going to hand it off to Nicole. I hope I didn't take too long, but she's going to take us a little bit to show us where in the strategist interface can we find these different diagnostics and um, how do we sort of navigate that? Well, thanks, Mitch. Um, my internet's a bit flaky, so if I drop out, oh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Sorry, it's um, breaking up a little bit. So uh, thanks, Mitch. That was an awesome walkthrough. So what we're going to do is um, just have a bit of a tour of the strategist um, stand user interface. And really what we've set up is the fact that we now have this tool available for us to actually make these objective decision thresholds on our pre-specified diagnostics, right? So this tool does the work for us um, in terms of where, whether our diagnostics pass based on our um, you know, set threshold. So we saw this interface last week at, at the um, tutorial and we looked through the, the cohort diagnostics. So this is the landing page, um, Odyssey Analysis Viewer. And I think um, if you go to the next slide, so Mitch is uh, driving me, so I'll just have to say next slide. It's not coming up for me. I'm sorry, I, I, okay. I thought I switched it. Is it cohort diagnostics now? Yeah, it is. It's just that my I'm a bit delayed because of my internet, but that's okay. We'll, we'll see how we go. So we've got the the cohort diagnos uh, diagnostics interface, and we had a look at this last time. We can have a look at um, each of the databases that have contributed uh, data. Look at the uh, um, different reports that we want to look at. This one is the cohort counts. Um, look at what cohorts and and have a look at what you know the the number of people in those cohorts and so on. So we had a good look at that last week. And if you didn't manage to see that tutorial, um, go and have a look. So we we can then uh, drill down into each of um, our reports. So the next slide. So I think it's the characterization here. Um, we can now start to investigate some of our results and look at our data. So for this um, time to event characterization, we can pick our target ID, a cohort, um, which is in this case the VEGF study, the flupercept exposures and the outcome of end stage renal disease, um, and can produce some plots there about when these events actually occurred. So there's three plots at the bottom there where you can start to really drill in and see when did those events occur in relation to exposure or start um, in the cohort. So the first um, panel there is really drilling down to the first 100 days before and after, um, and the, the colours show you like if it was an outcome before the exposure or after the exposure and in what time periods of exposure. So on exposure, after exposure and so on. So all the, the different colours sort of tell you when those um, outcomes occurred in relation to the exposure, when they're exposed or, or not exposed. Um, then we drill down, you know, we'll actually zoom out in the next um, view, look at a, a bit longer. Um, and then the very last one there is zoomed right out. And actually, I, when I saw this last um, plot there, I thought that was amazing. What that's showing you really is this kind of clustering of, of healthcare and, and, you know, that symmetrical distribution around um, uh, exposure. I thought that was, you know, pretty phenomenal to see. And you can kind of really see what, what's happening uh, in, in your cohorts there. So if we go to the next slide, thanks, Mitch. Right, so now we're getting into the actual diagnostics. So on the left hand side, we've got, you know, the, the menu. We're now in the estimation um, part of the, the viewer. So we can now look at our cohort method diagnostics. Um, you'll see there's the SCCS as well, and we'll look at that in a minute. And then there's the prediction tab as well. So if we look at the estimation for um, the cohort method diagnostics, we click here on the diagnostics and we can see the summary of all of the analyses um, that have been done and the, the, um, the diagnostics and then the thresholds as well. So for this example here, we've got the IBM CCAE database, the analysis um, was the cohort method, we're on treatment, we've got our target and our comparator cohort and the outcome cohort. And then we have all of the different um, diagnostics uh, presented here, like the maximum standardized mean differences of the means, uh, equipose, MDDR and, and so on. So, sorry, let me just um, get rid of 
chat so I can see. Right, so um, next slide, Mitch. So we'll look down uh, if we we click on, you know, uh, one of one of those examples and have a look at them. Uh, we can then start to see where they are diagnosed. Oh, that one more. Sorry, Mitch. Yeah, we can start to see whether they pass or fail based on uh, the you know thresholds that we've set. Now, these thresholds that we set are something we do. So you can and go into to the code there and, and set your thresholds. So if you if um, I don't probably suggest you change them unless we do that empirical analysis um, to determine different thresholds. But you can see that the, the thresholds are input there and we can um, see whether or not our balanced diagnostics pass or fail. So for this example, we're passing on balanced diagnostics, we're passing on equipose, we're passing on MDDR, um, attrition fraction and ease, but we fail on the shared balanced diagnosis. So based on all of that, we have this unblind yes or no flag. So in this case, unblind is one, meaning that we can unblind our results. Um, and Patrick, I need to ask you about this, why the, the shared diagnosis, um, balanced diagnosis fails, yet we unblind. And we can have a discussion about that later, unless you want to talk yeah, about I'll that. Just, I'll just ch chime in now, because we're in the interface, we're showing two different statistics, but the one we're actually using is the max SDM for covariate balance. So the, there's two statistics that are created, but the one we're actually using in this instance is the maximum standardized mean difference. And that's that first one where the value is less than 0.1. Yep, yep. So we can, uh, the, the shared max SDM there is not used in that overall assessment of the unblinding. Just yeah, in, in this study, we didn't yep. use that as one of our rules. Yep. Yep, right. Okay, so next, next slide. Thanks, Mitch. All right, so now we can, um, we've had a look at the overall diagnostics, whether things pass or fail, then we can click on the results tab just up there on the on the left uh, and start to really now drill down into our diagnostics and, and have a look at um, much more information about it. So for this example, um, we've got an MDDR of, of two, so we can, um, we have, you know, we can detect a uh, relative risk that is more than two if it happens to be true. Um, so we can also now see, you know, how what's the um, the time at risk in our target and our comp comparator and so on. Uh, and uh, I don't think there's much, uh, the number of patients in our cohorts and so on. So the next thing we can look at is the attrition fraction. So uh, here our attrition fraction was 0.5, I think. Um, 0.54, so again that passed. So it was. Uh, we can see that we've. It's really small on my screen. So about fifty percent. Um. Uh. You know, reduced to the to the final cohort. So that one passed, and you can see the attrition uh, table there. To go to the next slide. And actually, just to jump in with a really quick note, it's something that I did realize while reviewing um, the results recently. Is the attrition fraction is it is showing the proportion of people that leave the cohort. And so to know the proportion of people that stay in the core, you have to actually invert it and, and subtract yeah. from one. Right, so here um, is our equipoise. And again, we had um, 0.6 as our equipoise, so the proportion of the population between a preference score of 0.3 and 0.7. Uh, you see it's quite good kind of overlap there. Um, so that... Uh, has in this case um, passed our uh, threshold. So next slide. Uh, and now here is our covariate balance, um, our max SDM. And uh, this this is where I think there was a bit of confusion, at least in my mind, um, but I think I understand it now. So this um, covariate balance uh, table is all of the, the covariates and the maximum of uh, the standardised differences of means is, is here. You can see the point at, um, uh, what was it, one point something, uh, 0.17 I think it was, something like that. Uh, so these are all of our covariates prior to adjustment and then the covariates um, after adjustment. You can see that at the max, the shared max SDM doesn't pass because we've got these um, couple of points above 
uh, 0.1, but the MAPS SDM, uh, which is a, a smaller cohort of those uh, characteristics, does pass um, the, the diagnostic. So um, you can see that the majority of them do pass, but you've just got um, a couple here uh, that don't. Right, next slide. Um, and here's the ease statistic again. Um, we can see that in the um, uncalibrated, uh, we've got you know very good balance, um, and then the calibration again doesn't change uh, very much. And you can see the the hazard ratio between the uncalibrated and the calibrated are um, you know very very similar. So our ease is um, is very high and passes that test. The next slide. Uh, Right, so that's the, the cohort um, diagnostics. And so now we go to the next tab, which is the self-controlled case series tab. Um, we have different threshold, uh, different uh, diagnostics now with different thresholds. Um, so there's four things here. We've got minimum detectable difference. We've got the time trend p-value, the pre-exposure gain p-value, and the expected absolute systematic error, so the ease as well. So we'll go through um, each of those. And again, you can set the, the thresholds uh, in your specification. Uh, but here, the, the time trend P is, is our standard 0.05, um, pre-exposure gain uh, 0.05 as well, and the same ease as we had for the, the cohort study. So next slide. All right, so uh, MDRR for um, the self-controlled case series using the, you know, this exposure and outcome cohort was 1.5. Um, so we can detect a, a true um, relative risk uh, greater than 1.5. So if we go to the next slide. Right, so here are um, uh, some, you know, graphs where we can now look at this time trend. So with the self-controlled case series, as you know, um, we have, we, we compare the outcome rates in exposed time and unexposed time. And one of the key assumptions of our self-controlled case series is that there is no time trend. So there's no bias over time uh, in the rates of outcomes uh, in our exposed cohort. So one one of the things we can do in a self-controlled case series design is actually adjust for time trends or adjust for seasonality, uh, adjust for age effects and that kind of thing. And I was talking to Mitch just before we got on the call and, you know, I've done a lot of self-controlled case series designs where I've said I've adjusted for the time trend or I've adjusted for uh, age trends over time and um, published my result as if it's um, I've magically adjusted for, because I said I've adjusted for a uh, time trend, then it's magically gone away. What this diagnostic does is actually tells you whether or not after adjusting for uh, your time trend, whether you've actually adjusted for time trend, whether there's any leftover um, bias that would be um, impacting on your analysis. And I think for me, this has been, you know, an amazing um, visualisation of this assumption and whether or not the self-control case series is actually doing what you think it's doing. Um, so phenomenal um, kind of insight uh, into, into this time trend. So what happens here is we've got um, three different tables with the graph, sorry, the bottom graph there is the observed number of people that we have in our uh, in our self-controlled case series over time. Uh, so you can see, you know, there's this, that people start and then they and they drop off, um, I guess, from death or end of study. Uh, then we've got uh, outcomes per person. So we can see when the actual outcomes occur in calendar time in our patients um, that are in our self-controlled case series. So you, you can see there's a bit of a, um, a trend, not too much. When we adjust, our outcomes, we can now start to see what are the adjusted outcomes after adjusting for our time trend and then perform a test on that to say whether or not there is still some issues going on with our, um, our outcomes over time. And the red bars here are telling us when, but compared to the average trend, um, the trend in or the number of outcomes in that particular um, calendar time is greater than we expect. Okay, so the red means it has failed 
um, there's a difference in the in the number of outcomes than we would expect based on the average outcomes. And Patrick, you can explain that better if I've if I've mucked that up. But um, the red bars here are telling us we still have a problem with our um, outcomes, and we haven't adjusted for all of the. Uh, the trends over time in outcomes. And in this case, um, we've failed the, the cohort, the, um, the diagnostic. And what we'll see in our study, so this is the VEGF study, but we'll see in our study, we actually fail our um, analyses on all of the time trends for our self-controlled case series. So um, really kind of powerful, powerful stuff. All right, so next slide. Yeah, you, you, you explained that very clearly, Nicole, and I think the thing that I find fascinating about this, we're still working on exactly what is the right statistic for the time trend, but it's very clear. The basic idea that you need to assume constant rate of outcome is a core assumption to these models that we haven't previously been thoroughly evaluated. Like, I've not seen mo most studies ever even bother to look at it, and yet the, our experience has been this fails diagnostics a lot. And it's because a lot of our data just aren't very stable for 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 reasons that postdoc totally makes sense, but a priority we wouldn't necessarily be planned for. And particularly for those of you who plan to do research going into the future, you should know that December 2019 through um, the start of 2022 is going to screw with pretty much all of our analysis because our data went wonky during the COVID pandemic. And that's going to really screw with almost all self-controlled case series designs when the stability assumption is going to be like fiercely violated almost all the time. Oh, I, I agree. We've got a huge amount of work ahead of us how to deal with COVID and self-controlled case series. The interesting thing is, um, and we'll see this when we get into the into the app, that our uh, study for the flu of quinolones actually ends at 2019. And even then, we still we still fail. So yeah, we, we, um, we tried to anticipate got, one problem, but we yeah. didn't anticipate the other problems. <laughs> correct, correct. So anyway, I think this is this is um, an amazing uh, development. So great. So next slide. I think this is nearly our last one. Um, oh, OK, so here's another example again where you can see that um, the diagnostic really fails quite badly um, on the right hand right hand side there. Actually, I can't remember which analysis that is, but there, you know, it fails a lot is the take home message here. Okay, so next slide. Um, so the last an, uh, assumption for the self-controlled case series is this one where we say um, that there is kind of no protopathic bias, meaning that the um, the probability of outcome is not, is what is independent of exposure. So what we're, we're trying to look at here is whether or not this pre-exposure period, so the time before patients get exposed, um, is the rate of outcomes there, um, you know, unbiased. So in, in lots of cases, we have this problem where, um, you know, patients do, because they have the outcome of interest, they are more or less likely to get the exposure of interest. So um, in some cases, they're more likely to get the exposure of interest, say if they go to hospital and um, that means that they do get exposed to a particular medicine or um, they're contraindicated. So they have the outcome of interest and they're less likely to get the exposure because they're contraindicated for the exposure because they've had the outcome. Now, um, the self-control case series uh, can you know, deal with that by partitioning out a pre-exposure risk period. So this particular diagnosis, um, diagnostic is kind of uh, you know, um, examining that and providing an actual test for that. And the test that occurs is comparing the rate in the exposed period with this rate in the unexposed period. So we get a um, comparison, and then, of course, we can have a p-value for that. So in this case, the pre-exposure gain is suggesting that there is no difference in the rate in the pre-exposure period compared to the you know, exposed um, period. So it passes that particular um, diagnostic. So um, the p-value is greater than 0.05, so we don't reject the null that there is no difference. So um, in, this, in this instance, we have you know, one assumption of the self-control case series, um, you know, passes and, and the other doesn't. But because one doesn't, the whole thing doesn't. So it is not unblinded. So the next um, slide, thanks, Mitch. Uh, 
Yeah, so um, we are about three minutes from the end. We were planning to go through, um, I know, no, I I think I went longer than you, Nicole, but I I do think, you know, it came up in this morning's um, session, uh, do we have diagnostics for patient level prediction? And we absolutely do. Um, We're not going to spend any time going through them, which is probably for the best because Jenna is such an expert. You should absolutely seek out her Eden tutorial, which goes through all of this. Um, But again, just to mention, she has diagnostics corresponding to the ProBAST criteria, and we get a very detailed workup of diagnostics on um, these models when we look at ROC, precision and recall. We can look at calibration plots, um, and there is even more to make sure that the analytic subsetting that you do in order to fit models isn't drastically changing your population. Um, So I'll just leave it there. And I I will also say just for the purposes of our study that, you know, the predictive approaches that we use are um, very data hungry. They they need many outcomes to develop really meaningful predictive models. And in our analysis, we don't have a ton of outcomes. Um, We have looked through them a little bit and it does look like we actually have some very meaningful predictive models. But just to be clear, patient level prediction does require quite a few outcomes um, to, to power it. So I think the last thing we'll just say is once again to advertise that next week you are going to hear more um, about evidence synthesis um, and and it should be sort of a nice cap to the diagnostics presentation because there are diagnostics that fold into specifically the the meta-analysis module and again checking heterogeneity and study power across the data network. So you'll hear more about that soon. I know we have one minute left. I don't know if if there's any burning question or or how we want to do it, but um, well, Mitch, I wanted to just um, shout out that um, we've only like literally just got the uh, yeah the results, so they are now available in the Shiny app on uh, data dot uh, odyssey dot data dot um, So go and have a play with those results, um, and Mitch is showing you the screen now. But what we have done is uh, set up another call on Friday morning at this exact same time or Thursday afternoon your guys time if you're in the um eastern side so we're going to have that uh office hours hour to go through some of these results so come and join us then have a look through the results before you come and we can start to really drill down and and get into the weeds of the results so come along to that you should have that in your diary if not um reach out to jodianne <laughs>